Since the invention of fire, man has spun stories of gods and monsters. From a million years in the future, Heavy Metal presents Wonderwork. Feeling melancholy, listeners? I pulled this story straight from Heavy Metal's iconic 300th issue. On sale now, man. Forever. Let's see. Ah, here we are. This is a story about what it means to be human and how it ain't all it's cracked up to be. Giving deeper meaning to what it means to be, quote, put out to pasture. This is Prism Pastures. I never noticed how frail he looked. Thin, crepe skin, draped over dried sticks that moved as if by invisible strings, commanded by a graceful puppet master. His fingers would gesture about the holographic screens as his unquenched watery eyes drank in the flashing images. His voice, once commanding and clear, had withered to a whisper, difficult to discern. Emotions and statement punctuated through the shake of a fist, a twist at the waist, a beat to the chest, a sweep of a hand, a nod with his chin. All that once spoke was now still. Those invisible strings had been severed. That's what the electrical pulses of code streaming through Keats's CPU constructed and composed in his head when he found his master dead that morning. It was an original composition derived from a place inside of him he couldn't explain. Keats had been a dutiful servant and companion to Jason William Lasker since his awakening eight years, ten months, and fourteen days past. His master's penchant for poetry and their scriptures of a time long faded, as with its popularity, named him Keats. Previous companions were also named after writers he'd admired. Blake, Whitman, Poe, and others. Excavators of the human condition. Sorry, that was odd. Keats had always been aware of the others before him and their purpose to serve their owner. But Jason, as he insisted Keats call him, never treated him as a subordinate or a utensil, but likened to his pupil or his offspring made of synthetics and circuits. Keats had been created in his likeness, only much younger. It wasn't necessary for Jason to have a domestic worker, nor was it necessary for the majority of humans. The world had become fully automated and centrally connected to a mainframe. Everyone had become connected with each other, but separate. People would still travel and conduct meetings and attend social gatherings, but it was a ritual rarely practiced to remind themselves what it means to be part of the human species, as it had been for religion and its worshippers, now long dismissed and forgotten. Keats stared at the lifeless shell named Jason. Even science can only fend off the deterioration of organic matter for so long before nature and the order of the universe comes knocking to say, enough is enough. Jason's body prohibited him from taking part in these rituals without the assistance of androids decades ago. The effort to socialize in person became too strenuous and tiresome by the time Keats entered his life. Keats, block all incoming comms for today and bring me a cup of jasmine tea, he'd say each morning. Though his home was fully automated to care to Jason's every need, he liked having Keats tending to him even more. He liked seeing his younger self, free of ailments and physical limitations, fill his home with life, even if it was artificial. They would spend many late nights in deep conversation about a book they'd finished reading that day. 
Many of them took place in a world from a time long past that was difficult to comprehend from their world's present perspective. Struggle, despair, hunger, desperation. Sensibilities foreign to Jason and Keats. Merely words that Keats' databank could provide definitions to. But the spectre of longing to understand the purpose of being human permeated throughout all the stories and poems they'd read together. I will leave this realm knowing the sensation of warm blood pumping through my veins. The feeling of cleansing when I take a deep breath and exhale. Marvel at the hidden colors of air broken apart through a prism. But I will not know the meaning of my existence, he once shared with Keats. Jason's health had been declining for decades, causing him to assess what he had contributed to the world over his long extended life. Man was never meant to live as long as they do now. During the time of John Keats, when the man and famous poet was alive, the average lifespan was 30 to 40 years of age. Yet, Keats's life was even shorter. He died at the age of 25. It was for this reason that Jason had named his latest android after Keats, as he too will have a short life. The technical advancements made in artificial intelligence and manufacturing of androids gave cause for the International Synapse Symposium to put into law the limiting of lifespan to all androids. Each are given expiration dates, limiting them to live no longer than eight to 10 years. To their credit, they were concerned that they may develop an independent consciousness that would lead to free will and free thinking that they feared would lead to rebellion against the humans. Excuse me. Early in their relationship, Jason had asked Keats, what do you want in life? He had been awoken two years before and only knew what he was programmed to know, to serve and learn how to please his owner. Jason knew this question would go unanswered and it was the first of many designed to provoke and stump Keats. At times, he would tell him to fetch a book of his choice from the massive library without giving him a specific title. At first, this simple task was difficult for Keats and Jason would find him standing as if he was studying them, then realize that he'd overloaded his processors causing him to freeze. It wasn't to be cruel or a perverse exercise of power, but quite the opposite. He wanted Keats to learn to make a choice of his own choosing, not a bunch of bits cataloging and analyzing a calculated choice. Jason had inherited and cherished a huge collection of books passed down through the family, even though there was no longer any need of books. They were an obsolete relic from the past. All information and entertainment were accessible through the global hive that coursed through every home on the planet. There was no need for anyone to venture outside of their climate-controlled habitat. Fruits, vegetables, and protein of all varieties were farmed under enclosed biochemical cycle factories then processed into ready-made meals and distributed through an intricate network of automated drones. All human needs and desires were attended to, leaving the world outside of their own to become non-existent. Since the great permafrost pandemic, the countries across all borders built an interconnected community that transversed across vast lands, through mountains and across oceans. A new world society was created, but different ideology would divide them back into separate territories. War was averted only because the threat outside was greater. Many died. Those that couldn't afford shelter were left to their own devices. What became of them has remained a mystery. Or frankly, no one living in their safe high-tech cocoon gave a shit. Oh, uh, apologies. That happens sometimes. Jason didn't share the mindset of the others as he came into the world a generation since this epic event took place. 
This is the only life he knew, except for the stories his parents and grandparents would tell him. They spoke of the ocean as a remorseless breathing body of heaving salt water, discharging itself against the steadfast shores restraining it. The sparkling dome of black that resided overhead upon the end of the day, only to vanish with the rise of the new one, soon dotted with winged creature flying in the horizon. This was a magical world of wonderment and dreams that Jason sought to find in the words that populated his library of books. No new stories were being written, as the pandemic had shut down any hope of travel to distant stars, let alone on Earth. In a sense, Earth had become a living single cell, forever locked in the cosmic current circling the sun. Technology continued to crawl forward, but science had run its course for Jason. Essentially, he was a battery composed of organic cells that could no longer hold its charge. His approaching death became clearly inevitable. He turned every ounce of his waking attention to the writings of the great writers of the human condition. Through their suffering, he found comfort, a secret bond he'd never felt with his fellow humans that had cyberlinked with him throughout his long existence. His passion for stories of the past wasn't shared by his friends. So he'd turned to his android, Simon K-27, whom he renamed Dostoevsky, or Dos for short. Yes, Jason had dived into the deep side of the pool with Dostoevsky. Thankfully, Simon K-27 was on his last months before his expiration date shut him down, before he started considering suicide. Other androids followed, all named after heavy-hearted writers, which is why he'd name his last android John Keats, a poet of romantic verses that accentuate extreme emotions and sensual imagery. Jason hoped that he could give Keats a gift upon his death, a chance to be human. Not physically. He was not Geppetto wishing for the Blue Fairy to turn his wooden puppet Pinocchio into flesh and blood. But he wanted him to experience the joys of being human. For too long, Jason had lived a life numb to the extremes of human senses. This is why he'd turned to the insights of others from the past, as one has to know sadness and suffering to understand happiness and appreciation of being alive. Jason had told Keats, You have a life, numbered, yes, but so is everyone's. Those words cycled through Keats's CPU as he laid his now silent master hands across his chest. A queer sensation gently rippled out from his hand, extending outwardly to his extremities. The microsensory pads woven beneath his artificial skin has always made him aware of touch. Surfaces hard or soft, wet or dry, cold and hot, but never this fear. He'd never touched anything dead before. He could still feel the last faint warmth of his master's hands. He held them until it was only the cold of death that remained. The fear he'd felt had passed. He recalled a verse by his namesake, the loveliest and the last, the bloom whose petals nipped before they blew, died on the promise of the fruit. He pondered that last line, died on the promise of the fruit. Why did this poem by Keats come to mind? Was it programmed to upload upon Jason's death? Suddenly, as if a lightning bolt from the heavens had struck his CPU, he understood the metaphor of the fruit. For the first time, he was able to truly understand the use of an abstraction to represent another meaning. Yes, he always had the data to explain the definition of metaphor, but never had he understood the poetry of it. And more so, what or who did the fruit represent to Jason? 
Jason had spent his remaining years nurturing Keats, challenging his binary codes to behave abnormally. Keats now realized that he is the fruit. Jason's soul was the petals blown from the stem that was his body, leaving him with the gift of life. Keats gently lifted the human husk with his arms and drew him to his chest. He'd never realized how light he was, as if he was a sheet to be taken to be washed and dried and returned. He carried him into the vast library room that his owner loved, but hadn't visited when his legs could no longer find the strength to take him there. He laid him on the French antique chaise long, holstered in wine paisley, lovingly worn at his favorite spot where he once sat. Now he looked much smaller than Keats remembered. He began to sort through his databank and the bookshelves for Jason's favorite titles and placed them on the floor, building a tomb. He faced all of the titles on the spine printed in an array of colors and metallic foil inward, giving the appearance reminiscent to hieroglyphs painted on the walls of Egyptian tombs of kings. Once he'd reached the desired height and depth, he lowered him into the final resting place of his beloved. Friend, he whispered. This time it was not a word he understood by definition, but a word he'd felt. He went back to the walls of books and thought to himself that they too were tombs. He stopped on a book he hadn't read before. The book was frayed on the corners. The name of the author was barely legible, rubbed from use. Carlo Collodi. His memory bank didn't recall the author's name. The inner spine desperately clung to the pages as an oak tree holds onto its dry leaves at summer's passing. The book had clearly been a favorite among the Lasker family. He stood over next to his friend, Jason, resting in his tomb made of books. Keats looked upon him. It reminded him of the many nights his friend had drifted to sleep as he read to him. He gingerly opened the children's book and began to read. It told a story about a kind and lonely puppet master that longed for a son. He'd shaped pieces of wood into the image of the son he imagined him to be. Just as life is magical, his puppet too awoken. Keats was engrossed, and together he and Jason journeyed through the adventures awaiting on each turn of a page. Once Keats finished reading the story, he gingerly placed the book under Jason's hands, crossed against his chest. There, the book of a dream they just shared, and the dreamer will remain, forever entwined until they meld into dust to be carried across the eternal void. Who am I, you may ask? The teller of this story from the past. My name is not important, just know that I too once stood over a dreamer who'd passed, and I, too, took to reading him a story as his chapter among us had closed. That dreamer was Keats. The story I shared with you was his. I'd met him towards the end of his adventure across the world. He was awake in a world that had drifted into slumber. He sought new experiences and adventures that he could write into stories. New stories that could be shared and live on, beyond his short allotted time he was given to live among us. Before he expired, he gifted me with many stories from the past. But the stories that I cherish most are the ones that woke me to the world around me, as they were his stories. But. That's for another time. As I too am a dreamer, and my time is brief. I bid you farewell, and wish you a great adventure as you seek to write your life's story. Goodbye, friend. <laughs>